good morning everybody crafting journey here that journey tick on instagram i feel better i feel like myself finally oh my god i started feeling better finally yesterday afternoon and then i was in crystals live working on my planner last night and i'm so she she inspires me she really does i love you crystals crafty creations so um once a month she does a planner monday and she'll invite a few of us on a few of her friends on and um i fall behind in my planner a lot and she she always brings me back and you know someday it's just it's it's like brushing your teeth you got to get into the habit of it and i haven't been and so um hopefully you know with this monthly reinforcement that she gives i'll be able to do it i'm not going to be ordering a bunch of stuff although i'm going to check out the dollar store because it seems they have a lot of cool stuff so i did put up a new giveaway guys it is the second may yarn giveaway and one of the things that i ask in uh, as a question in the giveaway is have you ever diamond painted now if you're new to my channel um it's primarily diamond painting. I do crochet and I, this is crochet, crochet. I do loom knitting, crocheting, and uh, I'm trying to get the light pot on here and all kinds of other stuff. So that's why it's called crafting journey. But um, a lot of the comments that I got um, and I did want to address them were, no, I have never tried diamond painting. It seems very tedious. I don't think I could see it well. Um, I'm not as young as I look. Trust me, these are old, old eyes. Now, some diamond paintings can be tedious. Um, if you get into the, this is a much larger diamond painting than I would suggest starting out with. If you haven't ever diamond painted before, start out with a smaller diamond painting. Um, down in the description, I will link a couple of companies that I would recommend you go to to try a smaller diamond painting, uh, a smaller quality diamond painting. Where's my pens? Oh my God. And um, although you see me with fancy pens and fancy, you know, trays, you do not need all that fancy stuff to start with. Um, and with respect to whether you can see it or not, I use a light pad. Let me show you. And mine is very big, but you can get smaller ones. This is called an A2 light pad. You can order like an A4 or A3, which are smaller to start out with. But this is a light pad. When you turn it on, you can see the symbols very well. So don't worry about your eyesight. You'll be able to see the symbols if you have the light pad. So that's what I wanted to say about that. So look in the description, look at those companies, see if you um, see maybe a smaller one that you want to try. And I do have some tutorials and I will link one of the tutorials for the absolute beginner um, diamond painting for the absolute beginner and uh, check that out. So before we get into today's show, um, some other things I want to mention are the uh, we only have a few more days to sign up for two events that are going on. One is the mystery diamond painting event. Now, this is not a mystery diamond painting where you go to a company and order a mystery diamond painting. Um, a lot of companies now are carrying what they call mystery diamond paintings. Um, and you get it and it's a total mystery to you and your partner. But here what we do is we match you with the partner this is an opportunity for you get to get to know someone else in the community that you may not have known before. You guys get to talk to each other, you know, however you want to do it, messenger or whatever. Um, figure out what you like, don't like, and then you order each other a painting. Now you can decide what company you want to order from, how much you want to spend. Um, and then uh, you can let that company know that this is a mystery diamond painting and would they you can request that they leave the picture off of the canvas the thumbnail off the canvas and the inventory sheet a lot of companies will do that for you if they don't when when you mail it to your partner you just make sure you tell her that um, have someone else open it and cover it up and if it's covered in plastic you just have to cover it with some dark duct duct 
tape. So the um, the signups for that uh, will end on uh, May 31st. So because we want to match people up. And then we also have the Crafters 90 Day Step Challenge. I'm super excited about this. We have 75 people that have signed up for this event and it is going to be so much fun and we're not asking you know I, someone mentioned the other day there's someone in the community that gets like 80,000 steps a week that is not what we're asking for in this challenge that's not what it's about it may be about that for someone um, who's very active but it's about our progress so each week you will post your steps to your team captain and the goal is for you to do better this week than you did last week. Take a few more steps than you did the day before. Yesterday, I took a bunch of steps because my dog got loose. The lawn guy left the gate open and um, I had to go chase her down. Well, I don't chase her. I just walk after her. Um, there's a huge field across um, like an open area. There's a, there's a, a church beyond that. I don't know if the church owns this empty lot, but Tootsie loves to run around it. So I just let her run a little bit and then walk near her just to make sure she's not going in the street and then um, let her get a little exercise. And then I give up and come home and I, and I, the door won't be closed for two seconds and I'll open it and she'll be standing there like, Hey, where'd you go? <laughs> We were playing, but so she came in the house. But anyway, the forms, the Google forms for the mystery diamond painting and the Crafters 90 Day Step Challenge are both in the Crafting Journey Facebook group. I can also link them in the description of this video in case you don't want, in case maybe you're not on Facebook, right? Yeah. So, and you do want to participate because we would love to have you. So, can you tell I'm feeling better? Yes. Uh, it's Tuesday. What what day of the week is it? Tuesday, May 25th. Do, 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 do. I haven't done that in a while. Can you tell I feel better? Do, 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 do. Someday YouTube's going to say, you're not allowed to do that. <laughs> They'll say it's copyrighted. No, I, I'm going to copyright it. Um, what else is going on in the world? Well, I, you know, I, I almost canceled being on Crystal's Live last night because I was just rocking this painting. I'm like, just have to fill in this part here and then I can start the next row. Um, so I have like, after this, I have one and a half rows and then I'm done. This, this painting's pretty huge. Um, the size of it is, it's, a, I can't see it because it's rolled up. Um, but you'll get to see the whole thing soon. <laughs> And then I'll, I'll put it up on my Alice wall, um, the wall of Alice. If you guys are new to the channel, maybe you haven't seen the wall of Alice. Let's uh, see if I can show it to you. The wall of Alice. You're going for a ride here. There it is. The wall of Alice. So there you can see the Cheshire Cat. That's from Treasure Studios Arts. Then you can see... Um, the ring light is obscuring it, but that's the Mandy Manzano Alice, um, where the ring light is. Below this is a Willowing Arts Alice. Um, this is Serafina Alice from Diamond Art Club. It's called Alice in a Bottle. Um, the one over here to the far pointing where that is Time Escapes Us by Lizzie Falcon. That is also an Alice. And uh, yeah, so this is the year of Alice for me. It's Alice in Wonderland all year long. And the one I'm working on right now is the Hannah Lynn Alice. Um, it is called, I don't remember, <laughs> but you guys know what it's called. You, you guys always know. Anyway, yes, this is the Hannah Lynn Alice. <clears throat> I do try to stick with licensed artwork. Um, so all of the work that you see um, that I just showed you is by licensed artists. I try to support the licensed artists um, in the community. We want to make sure that they keep 
doing nice artwork for us and that they get paid for what they do. Um, yes. Okay, I'm just like, I want to get it done. I want to get it done. Okay, let's do what national day is this? Now, this is a very serious national day. It's no joke. Um, this is National Missing Children's Day. Um, President Reagan signed this um, back in 1983. He proclaimed this National Missing Children's Day, recognizing the hundreds of thousands of children who went missing each year. Um, so sad. But um, most children who go missing do come home. Like, and like 99.8% of children that are reported missing will come home. And then of the percentage that don't, 9% of those are kidnapped by family members. Um, but then there's that rare occasion where, you know, they're just kidnapped and never seen again. I'm thinking of that little girl in Peru that just, ugh, to this day has never been found. Um, Madeline, her name was Madeline, anyway. <clears throat> so, while this observance honors those who've gone above and beyond to protect the children, it also offers resources to continue protecting them further. Here's some ways to keep your children safe. And I did this when my children were growing, growing up. I always made sure, I made sure I had them fingerprinted I had fingerprint cards for both my kids. I had current photographs of them. I was married to a police officer, so uh, this is why we did this stuff. Um, if you have custody documents, make sure that you have copies of them available, you know, somewhere handy. Um, and make sure you keep all of the medical and dental records up to date. So that's how you can help your children. I don't know. They they used to come to the schools and do fingerprinting. I don't know if they still do that anymore. But that's what I did with my kids. It's a good idea. I remember there was <laughs> we lived in this little neighborhood in Hollywood, Florida. And um, I look out the window one day and I see these two children walking to the bus stop. And there was a man in a van following them. So I was really concerned. So I called the police. And it turns out that it was a neighbor down, down the block. And he, it, it was his kids. He was following them just to make sure that they got to the bus stop safely. And he actually thanked me for being so um, concerned and diligent. And we became fast friends. We are friends to this day. Their kids are grown, married. One's a firefighter. Um, one's a paramedic, you know, but wait a minute. I think they're all, no, yeah. One's a firefighter, one's a paramedic, and one's does real estate. But man, we became friends after that. Super close friends. The Their mom and I used to play tennis all the time, but all because, you know, I showed some love and concern for their kids. So watch out for the kids, you know, be, be mindful of your surroundings as well. And, and if you see something like that, report it. You never know, you know. Okay, that is the uh, Debbie Downer portion of the show. Let's do Judge, Jury, and Journey because uh, at the end of day four, the prosecution rested their case. And uh, they did put on the medical examiner yesterday. So things are coming into focus in this case. Um, I don't, I still don't know. I don't know what kind of defense the, uh, the defendant is, you know, I don't know what the defense team is going to do. I don't know. I don't perceive that the defendant is going to take the stand. He doesn't speak English. He has been sitting there the entire time with headphones on with an interpreter uh, behind him um, interpreting everything that's said in the courtroom because he just doesn't understand English well enough to 
follow what's going on in the courtroom. Um, so I don't know that he will be taking the stand. I, I highly doubt it because uh, that would open the door to the, 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 the evidence that's been suppressed. And that's the, the majority of his confession has been suppressed, you know, including turn by turn directions in the dark to the body that's been suppressed. So let's get to day four. I didn't write down a whole lot, did I? Okay, so they put on a special agent. He was the case agent. Um, the Department of Criminal Investigations will assign a case agent to these cases. And they kind, they're they kind of like the ringleader. They, their job is just to make sure everybody else is doing their job and kind of organize the investigation. So, and I was not real impressed with this guy. He didn't seem, I don't know if he hadn't read the file before he came on the stand. He didn't seem to remember a whole lot. He hadn't really done a whole lot because other people do the work. He just kind of, you know, makes sure it's all getting done. So, um, a lot of his answers were, well, you, this is, you, there's someone better to, that can answer that than me. But anyway, um, he, He's, he was called out initially for missing persons. He said they you know, organized searches for approximately 30 days. They searched for this woman. He said everybody in town participated in the search, the firefighters, um, the police. You know, He said they got calls from the hospital that the ambulance had extra fuel, would you, um, or the helicopter, the ambulance helicopter had extra fuel would you like us to help search and you know of course they did so everybody was searching for this woman um, which of course ended um, once they found the body but um, so he he was asked to describe all of the different agencies that were involved and he uh, he could only name the sheriff's department of course you know the Department of Criminal Investigations, which is where he works, the Sheriff's Department, the Iowa Department of Public Safety, the FBI, and of course we know immigration was involved and we also know that uh, there was, um, what was that other guy from? He, gaming, you know, so they had seven different agencies involved in this search and they're canvassing. They actually like had these maps of the Google maps of the neighborhood and they literally canvassed every single house. Um, they just went door to door. Um, so they, he was asked a lot of questions about Dalton Jack, which is the defendants or the, the victim's boyfriend who was not super impressive on the stand, I might add. Um, didn't seem real broken up about his girlfriend's death, but of course some time has passed. Um, but he was eliminated as a suspect, but he was interviewed multiple times and he did admit that he had had an affair with this girl named Jordan Lamb. Um, but to this investigator's knowledge, Molly Tibbetts was aware of this affair and had forgiven him. So apparently it was something that had occurred in the past and she had forgiven him. Um, the interesting thing I thought, um, well, here's what he says. The, both his, they talked to his employer, the boyfriend's employer. Um, they pulled his phone records. They talked to friends and everything supported that he had he was nowhere in Dubuque, Iowa. And I think yesterday I might have said this case occurred in Idaho. It's Iowa, not Idaho. My mistake. Um, I'm not from around there. Anyway, um, so all of this all of this investigation supported that he was not in town on July 18th, the day she went missing. Um, however, on the flip side, on cross-examination, it was brought out that he also could not prove that he, were, he was where he said he was. He was supposed to be in Dubuque, Iowa. And he, he had no, um, no records to indicate 
that he was there. There was no surveillance of the hotel footage because he said he was in this hotel. The hotel didn't have surveillance footage. Uh, the roommate that he said he had couldn't support that he was in his room. He gave two different stories. I was playing games on the lawn and drinking with my friends. And the other one was I was in bed watching a movie. Um, he couldn't produce any receipts, like, you know, that he got out for dinner or anything like that, couldn't produce any receipts. So that's, I thought that was good work on the part of the defense team to put a little bit of doubt about uh, this boyfriend here. Um, so another question he was asked um, was, uh, did during this investigation, you know, once they found the body, did they ever find this woman's cell phone or Fitbit? Those items were never recovered to this day. We don't know what happened to her cell phone and her Fitbit. Um, and they've never found the weapon. Um, you know, I, I listened to the medical examiner testimony later on, and we'll get to that, but it's clear that it was a knife. Um, that was the weapon, but it was never located. They did search his trailer. There was knives in his trailer, but nothing that matched what could have, you know, caused the injuries that were seen. Um, then on cross-examination, this investigator was asked about other suspects. I think I mentioned in a prior video that apparently this area has a lot of sex offenders. You know, sometimes when, you know, you have a history of sex offense, you have to register. And there, there are places that you are not allowed to live, and then there's places that you are allowed to live. Like you can't live within a certain amount of feet of a school or a bus stop. Uh, I know this because I have a family member that uh, stupidly um, pled guilty to a sex offense that um, he claims to this day he never committed. But you know, sometimes we all know that sometimes those prosecutors can talk you into taking a plea. Um, and sometimes it might be in your best interest to, to take a plea. Because if you go to trial and you lose, you know, you're rolling the dice, you could go to jail for a very, very long time. So I don't know why if somebody well, anyway, that's another a topic for another day. But anyway, so there's only limited places where these people could live. And apparently there was a lot of them living in this area to include this uh, guy named Ron Pexa, who um, they got two tips on this guy. One of the tips was that he had a torture room in his house. So they did go to his house. They didn't find any hidden room or a torture room. Of course, if it's hidden, are you really going to find it? Mm. I don't know. Um, and then the body was found only a quarter of a mile from this guy's home, but he apparently was ruled out as a suspect. Uh, and they never did a formal interview with this guy. Like they went and talked to him, but nothing that they ever recorded. They walked through his house, you know, with his permission. Um, um, so they did investigate each one of the people that were on this sex offender registry that lived in this area and they were all ruled out. Okay. So, and then um, last but not least, uh, and this is a quote, the investigation ended when the evidence was corroborated by the defendant's confession. <laughs> so, uh, all efforts to find anybody else that might have committed this crime ended. <clears throat> Um, and he admitted that no DNA from the defendant was found on the body, um, but he also said, you know, she was very decomposed. And well, there, there's more to come on that later on. Uh, the next person on the stand was this Den, uh, Kevin Haran. He's kind of a, a sort of a handsome guy, FBI agent, and his um, sole job is to, uh, he does cell phone records, you know, so he pulled, you know, when she first went missing, he got the cell phone records and he was able to, and he explained it all really well with the cell phone records. They were, you know, and the, the, 
the fact that they, they were pinging in, in different areas at different times, um, he was able to calculate that she was jogging in an easterly direction at a 10 mile per hour or a 10 minute mile pace. That's pretty good if you're a runner, a 10 minute mile. That's that's pretty, um, that tells me that she she's a runner. She she knows what she's doing. Um, Cause I, when I was a runner, I struggled to get a 10 minute mile. My, my miles were, um, in order to be in one of those marathons, you have to be below a 16 minute mile. So I was always below the 16 minute mile, but sometimes just barely. But to do a 10 minute mile, um, and this was a six mile route that she would run, that's pretty darn good. Um, she, so, but what he was able to um, ascertain though was that at about 8.25, um, the cell phone pings in a certain area and then it pings in another area um, around nine o'clock and, it's, and he was able to calculate that between those distances, that she, that cell phone was in traveling at around you know 60 to 70 miles per hour. So we can probably surmise that she was kidnapped around six, uh, around 8:25 that night, um, and then driven south to the cornfield. Um, and this this guy was really funny on the stand. I don't know if he's from Iowa, but he was like, I have never seen corn so tall. He says, it was 10 feet tall. <laughs> it was really tall, this corn. Um, I just thought that was pretty, pretty funny. So then he talked about the Fitbit that she was wearing. He says, and he says, what happens with the Fitbit is that it, it can, um, when you're done with your run, it will upload to your phone that, that the Fitbit uploads that information to your phone. So it's all in your phone. So from the phone, he he could get her older routes um, that had been recorded by her Fitbit, but he couldn't get her current route because she had not ended her run. So there was limited data that was going from that Fitbit to the phone um, on this current run, but he could based on the cell phone records of where it was, her cell phone was pinging and based on looking at her Fitbit uh, prior runs, he, they, could, they knew what route she was taking on her run. So that's how they knew what area to canvas, um, which I thought was super interesting. Um, and one of the reasons he said that they would want to canvas the area where she was doing that 10 minute mile is to find out if there's any cameras in the area, which they did find out there, you know, the one guy had four cameras on his house and that's what, how they managed to find that out. Once they had the general area where she was doing her run, they went house to house, you know, do you have a surveillance camera? Can we see the footage and blah, blah, blah. So. I thought that was super interesting. And he said in, um, th that a Fitbit also can give heart rate information. Um, he said, but in, in this case, it, it, they weren't getting that. And then he, did, he said he did even have one case where um, the Fitbit gave them, was able to establish the time of death of a person because um, the heart rate just stopped, obviously. Um, interesting, very interesting. Then we have the medical examiner, which we, I've been waiting for. So, so a lot of the medical examiner testimony is, you know, him explaining, you know, cause and manner of death and just educating the jury on what, what a medical examiner's job is. And that is to determine the cause and manner of death. So he said that this poor woman had been out in this cornfield, um, for a month, she was severely decomposed to the point where there were areas where the bones were already being seen, um, which would have eliminated the possibility of them getting any DNA and fingerprints uh, off the body for the most part. I mean, they did try, it just, she was just too decomposed. So he never could say definitively if she had been sexually assaulted or not. You just couldn't tell. You really couldn't tell. Um, 
But what he could tell was that she had multiple sharp force injuries from a jagged object, so a knife. Um, and that, that was her cause of death, multiple sharp force injuries, and the manner of death was homicide. So he said there was wounds, knife wounds on both sides of her head, so he could not tell what angle the defendant might have come at her, whether he was standing over her, behind her, to the side of her. There was He just couldn't glean any information because um, she had wounds on both sides of her head, both sides of her body, her abdomen, her chest. She, um, he found nine definitive wounds. So she was stabbed at least nine times. And he said, you would expect a significant amount of bleeding, you know, especially with a head wound. But with these wounds, you would have expected a significant amount of bleeding. But he said it could have occurred outside of the vehicle, you know, and then just dissipated from the weather. In fact, that, you know, they had a, a tornado came through that area the next day after she disappeared. Uh, they had a tornado and then they had rains and they said the cornfields were muddy and so it just made it very very difficult to collect the, the evidence that they would have needed so um the prosecution rested that's their case what do y'all think so um the defense did a motion for acquittal um, stating uh, that the case that, you know, they, and like I've, I've explained this before, it is really a, just a procedural thing. Um, there's really never much expectation that these things are going to be granted. Um, and what the defense says is that, you know, they did, the state did not prove their case. They did not put enough evidence on, to support that their client killed this woman. Well, of course, we know that's not true. I mean, even if you take take in mind that we don't have all that evidence that, you know, the confession part that was suppressed, we know at the cornfield, he said, I brought you here. I did it. So I did it, right? And then we also know that her body was in his trunk and that he took the body out of the trunk and put her in the cornfield. So... Uh, I'm going to have to say, yeah, they did put on a, a good case. So the judge agreed and he said, uh, you know, the motion for acquittal is denied. Um, so today when the trial starts, the defense will start their case. Now, if you'll recall, um, they, the, the defense made a very unique move at the beginning of this case and they deferred their opening statement. Um, it's very rarely done, but in this case they did it. So now that it's their turn, they will do their opening statement uh, this morning and then present their case. Very clever. And these are very clever lawyers. So I'm anxious to see um, their case, uh, how they present their case. And if they're able to put some reasonable doubt, that's all they're trying to do. Just put an inkling of reasonable doubt into the minds of these jurors. Um, and one thing I, they, that the defense pointed out in their motion for acquittal that I, I actually agreed with um, is that, you know, in order to get first degree more murder, you have to show malice aforethought, you know, which means you like planning. Uh, um, however, you know, and so their argument was there's really no indication that this was something he planned to do, you know, that it was premeditated. Um, so maybe, you know, maybe he'll get a second degree murder uh, conviction. I don't know. So more to come on that tomorrow in the morning show. So we can do this day in history so I can go to work, gotta go to work, 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 work. I'm still working from home today. I have one more day to kind of rest my body. Yesterday, though, I got, like I said, I was feeling better in the afternoon and I got back to one of my projects that it's it's a very tedious project. Um, so I've been, because my head was so fuzzy, I wasn't really able to work on it. So I got to work on it yesterday, which I'm very glad about. So um, 
this day in history kind of ties in with what national day it is national missing children's day it was on this day in history um Try to get the exact date for you get the exact date rebecca do, 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 do. where is it okay here it is um may 25th 1979 1979 i had just graduated from high school now i graduated in 78 so anyway six-year-old eaton pates goes missing while walking the two blocks from his home to the bus stop goes missing never seen again and um they look for this kid and look for this kid never found his body a um, couple of years later they decide um, that they are going to put his name and his picture his father was a photographer and he had this gorgeous black and white picture of his son so they put put it on a milk carton he was the first missing child to go on a milk carton now unfortunately after his picture gets put on the milk carton um, there was a gentleman uh, a suspect that did confess to his murder um, I don't know if they found the body but they someone did con uh, confess that he abducted the child and murdered the child and he was sentenced um, his name was Pedro Hernandez, so um, he was convicted. But um, that was, he didn't get convicted until 2016. Wow. For a murder he committed in 1979. Wow. So, um, yeah, so he was the first child to be on a milk carton. So, uh, a lot, so I don't even... Do they still do that? Do they still put missing children on the milk cartons? I don't know, but this was the first kid. If if I remember, let me do it right now. I'll put a picture of this um, child so you can see it, you know, in honor of Missing Children's Day. So prayers for that family anyway. So today I'm going to work. Play Animal Crossing. I finished, my, I finished the... Um, part of my yellow scarf now I want to go I want to go around the edges and add like a yellow uh, frilly thing I just think it would be cute um, if I don't like it you know I'll just take it out but well, I want to do some edging with the with the yellow frilly stuff anyway you'll know when I do it I like to do crochet late at night I was up late last night crocheting and you know I just find it very relaxing I'm watching Chicago fire and I'm crocheting in bed um, I used to diamond paint late at night but um, it just it's more relaxing for me to just sit in my bed crochet I gotta get caught up with my temperature blanket oh my word anyway guys it's been a great morning I hope you guys have a great day don't forget to sign up for the 90 day crafters step challenge and the mystery diamond painting um, I will put the, both the forms in the description to make it very easy for you. But you're welcome to join the Crafting Journey Facebook group. Love to have you. Um, I will see you all tomorrow in the morning show. Bye.